Good morning to all. It's a pleasure to have you here in this beautiful morning, online, virtual. Um, we have today a really new topic for us, but I think a very important and growing topic, social selling and the changing attitudes towards entrepreneurship in Europe. Our host is our board member, Alex Agio Saliba, member of the European Parliament, also member of IMCO, Ample and IDA committees, rapporteur of the Digital Service Act, and our chair for SME Connect Working Group Platform Economy. Thank you that you are supporting us again. I think it's always a pleasure to work with you because you have really a practical approach for our SMEs and SMEs need practical legislation and also practical help. Thank you that you uh, sharing this, this, uh, these targets with us to bring Europe closer to our SMEs and our SMEs closer to Europe. Please, the floor is yours. So first of all, thanks host, thanks SME Connect for always being very good collaborators and always being a very good voice and a positive voice even in these, in these difficult situations that each and every one um, is living for, for, for our SMEs. SMEs are the backbone of our economy. So for us, it's of utmost importance, both as a European Parliament, but also as a strong lobby uh, within, within Europe to be a strong voice for, for our SMEs. And today it's a privilege for me to be here hosting this um, event, discussing um, the importance of social selling and also the changing attitudes of entrepreneurship in Europe, especially the change in attitude that was also a direct result of the pandemic and the realities uh, of restrictions that are being undertaken in a number of member states and due again to the, to the pandemic. And again, thanks Mway Global Entrepreneurship for this um, report, which is I, I believe I have already seen a copy of this of this of this study is all, is a very positive one um, because it is tackling very important realities that our enterprises, our sellers uh, using uh, social selling are facing during these during these times. So it's a very timely study which should help us understand the current um, realities, current challenges that we are facing as we speak. Uh, the report and also this discussion is intended and it, 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 it's, it's an interesting debate on social selling uh, in the light, as I said, of the changing nature of both our economies and also the fast changes that we are witnessing when it comes to digitalization and the new ways basically of doing businesses by social media networks and also digital platforms. Digital platforms which have become the public utilities of our time and are so essential, so important, so important for the livelihood of, of, of thousands uh, of, of sellers throughout, throughout Europe. And it is essential to look at the new emerging forms of entrepreneurships and also new business models such as social selling. Social selling. Consumers and also businesses, I believe that they have embraced, embraced the platform economy search and also are trying to make the most uh, out of it, um, the best out of it. And platforms have basically benefited uh, and, and, and they have benefited both consumers and also businesses by giving them an easier access to the products and easier access to, the, to their services, and also by facilitating the transactions between these two parts. Furthermore, amongst the many dimensions revealed by the current COVID crisis that we are living, the role of digitalization and digital services is a prominent feature. The shutdown of many EU countries due to uh, the pandemic demonstrates the importance and also our reliance our reliance on a sophisticated digital infrastructure to keep our countries, our economies, and even our people at least running at the basic level. Digital services have enabled many people to continue to work from home, and they have supported our private life, our businesses, our economic lives, and basically they have saved us from going bankrupt. The digital society has also proven to be 
a vital component of a crisis-prone society and also a crisis-prone economy. And without the existing digital solutions, the crisis would definitely have had a more um, devastating impact on our, on our lives, on the businesses' lives. And that is why today's discussion will enable us to understand better the new challenges that we will be facing, but not only challenges, the opportunities uh, that the digital ecosystem, that the digital revolu revolution uh, will provide us also in the post-COVID world. Because as I, as I like to say, we will never revert fully back to uh, post-COVID. So we have to embrace these new changes and also make the most uh, out of them. It is essential to be ahead of our times, uh, be better prepared and also provide the right policy uh, choices, safeguards, and also protection. Protection both for our entrepreneurs, but protection also for our consumers in this digital environment. And this debate is even uh, further energized around the recently proposed DSA and DMA regulations and also the sharp uh, increase of digital platforms such as Facebook, such as Instagram, uh, which are being more prominently used by our entrepreneurs to promote and also advance their businesses and also advance, advance their startups. Therefore, I am looking forward for today's um, discussion and also the results of this, of this important study. Entrepreneurs need to better understand, better understand how to benefit and take full advantage of this digital revolution by using smart technology, smart services. Businesses and SMEs need to be adequately equipped to the digital transition uh, that our industries are facing and also be better equipped to respond to future talks, demands, and social media tendencies and behaviors. Undoubtedly in this crisis, having people with entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial attitudes, with creative ideas who are ready to set up their enterprise, to invest, invest in the future could be a provider for and also a positive driver for um, the right investments for the creation of jobs and also for our economic growth but in reality we also need a safe a safe online environment so that people do not fall in the trap of big multinational companies that basically are dominating our market i can imagine the the fear of failure and also the uncertainties of, of the times that we, are, that we are living. And this could be pot a potential also setback for many entrepreneurs in the current crisis that we are living. That is why we need to gain a deeper understanding, a deeper understanding of entrepreneurs' motivation, entrepreneurs' desires, and the new business models such as social selling. And that is why we need, and we have to ask ourselves and answer some uh, of the most important questions that we have uh, that we have in front of us what do people think of entrepreneurship and what is their general attitude uh, about how entrepreneurship friendly society would finally entail what are the current setbacks and the biggest fears of entrepreneurs and how we can address these at european and also at national level. What is the motivation behind becoming an entrepreneur and their current needs and what their current needs are in these situations? And we also need to know how people think and act and the common fears and hurdles in different member states. In other words, we need to create the right environment for entrepreneurs by eliminating all barriers and putting in place instruments and also increase support and encourage them in the current digital environment. Therefore, I am glad that we are here today to discuss this survey, looking at these particular questions, and not only looking at them, but being able also to, to answer them. And the digital revolution and platform economy and social media networks, and I conclude on this, this point, provide an array, a limitless number of opportunities, and also are revolutionizing the sector and also the European economy changing our lives, changing 
our business models. Still, we need to do it the right way. And that is why it's so important and it is so timely to answer these questions, to be better equipped, uh, have better understanding, to face these challenges and ultimately um, pass from these challenges and end up from this pandemic in a better situation that we have entered uh, in it way back uh, last March. So I'm looking forward for this um, discussion. Thanks, Host, uh, and thanks also uh, for organizing this, this very important and timely discussion today. Thank you very much, Alex. I think you give us really a broad overview. And I think also a, a positive message you embrace uh, knowing about the challenges, but embracing the chances. And I think really also in the end, what you say is about entrepreneurship. I have to say I was shocked the last time we had a, a survey about uh, young people between 16 and 25. Only every seventh want to become entrepreneur. It's not very popular to open your own business at the moment. I think this is, is a wrong approach. And uh, that we learn how... Uh, this business environment is changing, how entrepreneurship is developing and what we have to face such uh, uh, reports like the Embry Global Entrepreneurship from 2020 is very important for us because we know to know what's going on outside for also from Brussels. But uh, we, I think now we will have an interesting view on it also, especially after this or still in this uh, pandemic by Anna Romero Martinez, Associate Professor in Strategic Management and Entrepreneurship, Vice uh, Dean from International Economic Affairs, Complutense, uh, oh, sorry, Complutense, University of Madrid. Thank you, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Okay, hello uh, everyone. And thank you so much. It's my pleasure to join this event today and share with you all uh, some of the main uh, results of a 2019 Angwe Global Intervency Report. Um, regarding the methodology, just uh, some details. Um, Angwe Global Intervency Report to promote discussion on this topic and raise uh, awareness of the importance of entrepreneurs. Uh, to collect the data, a sample was selected from each of the 12 European participating countries, and the sample consisted of uh, 12,132 respondents. The field work uh, lasted from September to uh, November, 2019, so just before the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Uh, the results show that uh, the majority of the European respondents have a positive attitude toward entrepreneurship. Uh, the 51% of the respondents think that having their own business is a desirable opportunity for themselves, either now or in the future. Uh, however, an in the US, only a considerable number of, Euro of respondents in the Europe, again, 57%, would like, uh, would take, sorry, the advantage of family and friends and other social networks when starting their businesses. However, in the US, only 41% of respondents would do so. Therefore, there are encouraging results since entrepreneurs play a key role in improving uh, employment and driving economic prosperity and societal well-being. Uh, so a proactive attitude by government, businesses, academia, and society in general boosts entrepreneurship-friendly condition and will generate new startups and other type of entrepreneurship leading to competitive of the economy. In relation to the type of a business opportunity in which the potential entrepreneurs are interested in, and in Europe, e-commerce generates a higher interest among the respondents, 52%, followed by freelancing, 
and social media and traditional selling. Therefore, traditional selling is still a business opportunity in which uh, the respondents are really interested. In the US, uh, freelancing, e-commerce, and traditional uh, business generate the highest interest in, uh, among respondents. However, just under one third of Americans are interested in social selling. Certainly in this uh, digital age, uh, the most predictable outcome was the high interest of uh, respondents in selling their product and service online, that is e-commerce, and the use of social selling. There are many advantages to selling online nowadays, of course, and in addition, social selling takes e-commerce, uh, the digital entrepreneurship, a step further. However, traditional selling is still considerable a good, a viable option. Uh, in a digital world, respondents still uh, show an interest in traditional selling. Selling product and service through an established location, face-to-face -face business, can be a way maybe to differentiate from the competitors. So direct and personal contact can make a difference sometimes. Maybe a, 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 an optimus could be uh, creating a kind of balance between e-commerce, social uh, media selling, and the traditional selling, sometimes. Um, regarding the benefits of starting uh, your own business, uh, respondents are more excited by working on something that they are passionate about and being their own, biz their own boss. So, we can conclude that the respondents are improvement driven in terms of fulfilling themselves by doing what they love and seeking high independence and higher income. The third uh, benefit that is providing an opportunity for extra incomes so that sometimes uh, the entrepreneurship is a complementary source of income. So it's, it comes in addition to the main uh, home um, uh, household income. When uh, distinguishing uh, under 35 years old and over 35, the scores are significantly higher for respondents under 35, particularly when it comes to having their own business as a desirable career opportunity and leveraging their own social network to do so. In relation to the educational level, the scores are significantly higher for those respondents with higher education level. And regarding the gender, the entrepreneurial intention, the entrepreneurial attitude is significantly higher for men than women. It still is higher. Um, in relation to the different uh, business opportunities, uh, business models, respondents under 35 are far more interested in all options compared to those over uh, 35. Additionally, the higher the educational level, the higher the interest in, uh, um, of the respondent in all the, the business types. And men, men sorry, are significantly more interested in e-commerce, freelancing, serial economy, and franchising. So therefore, a man under, a man under 35 years old and high, highly educated, so higher entrepreneurial intention. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay, <laughs> sorry. I was uh, saying that uh, therefore a man under 35 years old and highly educated, so higher entrepreneurial intention, according to the report. And finally, I want uh, to show some um, information, some data about social selling. Uh, respondents consider that social media channels are the best way to maximize the number of customers, sell products, and promote a business. However, as you can see on the slide, the 37% of respondents don't think that they have a large enough network to effectively promote their business. And 35, I'm sorry, and 31% of them feel that they don't have the skills uh, to effectively market their business on social media channels. 
Uh, definitely, social networks have revolutionized, as you mentioned before, the way people act in the personal, social, and, and work environment. And now it's not working there. My God, I'm so sorry. No, it's not working there. Yeah. And uh, uh, finally, by age, uh, under 35 uh, um, years, the respondent under, under 35 are significantly more likely to feel social selling is the best way to maximize customer and promote a business. However, over 35 are far more likely to feel that they don't have the skill to do so. So in conclusion, uh, the digital world and new technologies uh, have changed the way we sell and buy. Social selling serves to create productive relationships with customers through social networks that help to sell more. So investing in digital resources is a profitable investment that would lead to significant cost saving in the medium and low cost. Uh, in addition, the pandemic has created a new environment that involves uh, three uh, challenges, but also opportunities. And uh, so the pandemic has shown that digitalization is here to stay and it's really advisable for companies to invest in digitalizing their businesses. So thank you so much. Um, any comments or any uh, question are welcome. I'm so sorry for- oh, Thank background. you, Anna. It shows only that we have improved our infrastructure in Europe with the digital connection. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, every SME has to fight with in, in, the, in certain regions with these problems. But I have to say it was a very interesting uh, presentation. I think you can also turn on your camera again, Anna. And um, I think what was I was surprised that uh, that also female yeah. entrepreneurs are lacking a little bit on e-commerce. So I was a little bit surprised. And also, but the difference between the, the, the age, uh, how using uh, social selling and, and, and in a digital way, it's not so surprising because we have data that in South Europe, the SMEs owners are, are very old compared to, to the rest of Europe, over 60. And the same, you have a, a, a link to it, how e-commerce and social selling are used uh, digital. And this is lower than in other, like in countries like in Belgium or Netherlands. And I think this can be a link, an explanation of what you uh, survey as your report shows us now. So we're coming to Benedict um, and questions, of course, in the end, after we have the time, we have a dialogue between the, the, our speakers here today. And then we will have also questions to about this uh, report. Benedict, I think uh, what, you, what we saw now at, at this uh, report, is this also uh, analog uh, like in the world of, of startups? Do you have also the feeling that uh, the young startups, we have not only young people who are starting startups, that there is a difference who starting how uh, the, their businesses and now, after 2019, 2020, is there still a spirit of entrepreneurship or it's more of security what the people want now? Please, Benedict. I think those are very important big picture questions and I'm gonna do my best to give a shot at answering them. But first, let me thank you for um, giving us the opportunity to take part in this conversation. Um, I'm personally relieved to see that it's not just Germany, which can still improve with its uh, broadband network. And I hope, you know, please holler if my connection is, is uh, going bad as well. But, but for those of you who don't know us, Allied for Startups, who I represent here, is a um, global network of startup associations, ranging from Startup Canada to Silicon Valletta or, or Startup Malaysia. Um, so our job is to uh, improve the policy environment for startups. And I think it you know, goes without saying that COVID-19 has been kind of a magnifying lens on technology, um, both in terms of us handling the crisis, uh, but also as and we're here to talk about today in terms of promoting growth and innovation. So I think I, I really appreciate, Horst, that you are you know, taking a more forward looking approach. And I fully underline what Mr. Saliba said that, you know, these are these trends, digitization and e-commerce we are talking about. That's, you know, it's not something we can stop. It's not like we can put the toothpaste back in the tube. 
this is here to stay and you know it's about us to um, look forward and think about how we uh, best deal and, and find the best approach to it also with policy. So I, I'll just I'll make three quick observations maybe to kick off the discussion. Um, I think the, the um, first one is kind of self-standing. Um, social selling, the way we see it, it's, it's not um, changing the character of European enterprises. It's the consumer who is. Um, more and more consumers, and the presentation by Professor Romero Martinez underlines this, uh, especially younger folks, are spending time online. And uh, the last year has you know, transformed the walk to Main Street to your laptop. And um, I've, I've read in preparation also for this that you know, 87% of businesses in a survey um, canceled events uh, because of the pandemic, 66% postponed events. So where do folks go? And, and um, social selling is one way where businesses can take advantages of these new channels. And um, I think it's clear that you know, startups who don't have many fixed assets um, in analog businesses, as, as you said, Horst, uh, they will be in the prime position to react to new approaches like social selling. And, and I think going further, startups have it you know, with their digital DNA and user centricity. Um, for them, social selling, where it's a lot about kind of social media and you know, having your own content and um, user engagement, they're kind of in a, in a great position to do this. Um, so I think it's, it's what I would like to add is that startups are, are you know, so doing this themselves, but they're also supporting SMEs. Um, you know, if you think about the right kit conclusion replica, and I'm sure Camila will share more examples, um, that you know, there is a, an avenue for, for other businesses to hop on the, on the train as well. And uh, it's no secret that this will continue post COVID. And the second thing I'd like to, uh, to share, and maybe this will help, uh, help address Horst's question as well is, Social selling is a great uh, and growing avenue to kickstart a business idea through. Uh, in one way, you can see it as a sort of democratizer or enabler. Uh, you can use um, online tools to make a value proposition directly to consumers. Maybe like 100 years ago, you were you know, building something in your garage and trying to sell it in your neighborhood. Well, this is a bit like doing this online and you know, trying and testing this with your immediate environment. And, um, I think you know using the the social networks and the vibrant platform economy you have around you motivates many young folks to to launch a business and and I hope that this can be strengthened post COVID. Um, and this brings me to the third uh, point I'd wanted to kick off with is that um, by and large we we want to be open and should support as many different forms of entrepreneurship as we can post COVID. And I think there's multiple ingredients that make this happen. Professor Romero Martinez's presentation, I think, um, uh, was, was a really good start to look at this. And I think her report also had a really good uh, section on barriers to entry. And I, I checked it out and it said 45% of respondents in, in the report uh, stated that raising capital is one of the barriers to entry. Um, managing legal guidelines, such as EC regulations, taxes, et cetera, is for a quarter of respondents a barrier to entry. And, and fear of failure was another one. So uh, there's enough topics in that presentation for many webinars, but I think you know, a lot of us are here to focus on the regulatory environment. So I just wanna mention two things on that front. Um, as part of the SME strategy, there the will soon be a startup nation standard, which will be a set of best practices uh, that already exist across member states uh, that we would like to see scale across Europe. This will help our economy digitize and, and support startup entrepreneurs. So, you know, if more and more folks are going digital, then being able to found a company digitally, online, in English, in one day, in any country in Europe, should come naturally. Um, so so um, that's uh, one of the, uh, the, the Startup Nation Standard is one of them. And the other one, and, and Mr. Saliba mentioned it as well, the DSA DMA is the other big uh, file uh, which is coming up. And here, you know, it's, it's clear we have over 10,000 platforms in Europe. I think if we make the DSA and DMA about providing legal clarity and the rocket fuel for the startups, then we will have achieved something. If we can make this percentage uh, from the survey, 24% uh, managing legal guidelines uh, as, a, as a kind of barrier of entry, if we can decrease that percentage with the DSA, DMA, um, and, you know, and see that significantly reduced in five years time, then I think we will have achieved something with the, the, the DSA, DMA. I'm looking forward to the, the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this was there were very 
important points you, you mentioned. I think also the last one. So more complicated we are doing the legal framework, so more we keep small businesses and young entrepreneurs away mm -hmm. to, to, to enter the digital market, I think, because big companies can handle this better than, and than, than small ones. And I think we have to understand that regulation can protect the consumers, what is very important, but also can keep out the small guys from, from this, this, this opportunities. Uh, what I would like to ask you also, social setting, it started in fact already with crowdfunding for startups. Huh? And, and in fact, this is already the, the, the starting point. Is this why the spirit is different already? I think that's a great point. I didn't even get to mention uh, the funder beams and the other crowd funders. Um, so we can also look at addressing this problem with access to finance. With uh, uh, I mean, social selling is maybe kind of in the letter of the law of the definition. Maybe it might be a bit of a stretch, but you're absolutely right that uh, leveraging social uh, capital for fundraising is something that we see more and more of. And hopefully, again, we can leverage that uh, post post COVID. Thank you. And now we're coming to Mike Peterson. Mike, you're an expert uh, since many years for social selling in the digital environment. You are a member of the Content Queens Global Network, a female freelancer network for content writers. Um, you're working with, with hidden champions, with uh, big companies, with small companies. Uh, you have a focus on B2B, B2C. You manage e-commerce, web shops. Um, what is your experience or reaction on this? How SMEs, how the, the business sites embracing social setting via digital networks? What is your, and what would be your advice to encourage more to, to go this, this uh, to use these uh, chances? Please, the floor is yours. Frankly said, um, most of companies I know or I knew didn't make a good thing at social selling and didn't understand it really. And um, my point of view is uh, we have to define, first of all, before talking about social selling, we should better understand what could be really uh, all inside social selling. Because first of all, it is a topic and it's a huge, under, beneath under social selling, there could be really a huge um, wide range of, of different things. But for me, it started all with topic. Benedict, you mentioned the point. Um, it's it's uh, at the very first uh, moment, it's all about the content. So understand what is the power of content and understand what, what could be achieved with content is first, first thing for me before we talk about, ah, I would like to sell, I'm a salesperson, I would like to sell something, whatever. And before um, talking about legals and all these things, first of all, you have to be this, um, in my, this mindset of what can be achieved, what can I, um, what, or in other way, um, the perspective of, for the customer, what is the customer's need and what is the worth to talk about, what, uh, um, put your product uh, aside and just find out what is the really benefit for your, product, for your, for your customer. Um, and all this have started from my point of view, really at the beginning uh, of the journey and understand why it could be helpful uh, building up your own network, why it could be helpful asking your own network to um, go inside their own network and to make your or to, to grow your own network by this. And I found in the presentation something like, um, I'm not sure if I have the skills for uh, doing social selling. I'm really think I could bother my, my network and so on. Um, so first of all, it should start here inside between one ear to another and just make the decision. Yes, I would try to like, I would like to uh, start with social selling and um, I would do the very first step. So that um, bring me to what skills should have an entrepreneur, what uh, skill set should have a small or medium sized company. And um, as I, because I started with the sentences frankly, um, most of them don't have the skills, don't have the processes, don't have the allow from uh, the um, whole company to do this with a special spirit because it's not about selling high product and please buy it, but it's much more than reaching out with 
wow content at the very first moment to, to inspire people. And at the same time, we have to talk about personal brand and all these things because um, social selling is not more a uh, procedure. It is, in my world, it's more about being a, a person, being a type, having, having a story, have something to tell and have, have other people to talk about. So it started really um, far, far away from the product itself. Uh, it started uh, really by being a natural person outside, out there in the social network and act with others. That is really the first thing we have to say. And at the end of the journey, there is maybe a product, but it is not the need to, to hold the product every time up there. For example, um, I had a role in a company and we changed the uh, marketing from old school marketing up to growth um, marketing. And we changed the old school sales team to um, digital sales. And in this journey in between, um, as a market, uh, marketing leader I, uh, and uh, as a person who was really uh, years of years inside social networks out there and talking about what we achieved with the growth marketing team and so on, I, I didn't um, waste a single a word of the product, but I, I told about what happened inside the company, what was the change, what was the new spirit, what we are acting as a team and so. And um, long before the salesperson are, were able to, to act as a social selling person, um, customers from outside wrote me messages and said, hey, I, I saw this really interesting. Can you give me uh, information about the products? And so this is an example me as a, um, let me say, social highlighter, for example, um, was a social selling person without doing social selling. And this is, I, I think, a really um, important thing to understand the whole world of what can social selling be and what it should not be. And start with being a person, being, in, being interested or being um, someone who have an attitude, someone who uh, says something with clarity and so on. And then the journey can start. Thank you very much. I think this gave us really a practical side of social selling in digital. Uh, when I hear this now, it is an investment. It's not so easy. It is perhaps technical, not uh, easy to enter. But like you say, you have to invest in your to think about what you are, what you are, what you are selling. To think about your your clients. To think uh, to build up a network and an image. In fact, in the end, this is a lot of time you have to invest. Um, do you think, in, in, in fact, it's about trust building or not? Definitely, because uh, it's, uh, first of all, uh, all about you as a person, you as a brand, and it is about trust, but um, that is all uh, only the basement. The most important thing is um, find out what your customer is, um, where, where the pain is. To the customer pain is or what are interesting points to talk about or to to spread out into the world and find out this really important thing because um the basement is the trust uh, for you as a person and it's um it's not a possible and it's not necessary to start from the very first moment with everything um perfect doesn't happen so it's a journey and it's a journey and you have to con you have to start right now with the very first thing, very first post, very first account, and so on. Start right now and continue and make yourself better. Find out what works better, leave what didn't work, and so on. It's, it's a journey, but start now. And um, the power is to, you mentioned the content queens, for example. Um, we are queens, so it's a plural. And the um, really power of the sisterhood is we um, help each other with our contents inside, for example, in LinkedIn. So uh, engagement and sharing and, and talking about and so on is really an important thing for having more awareness or having more um, for, for the for the algorithm. So um, build your own network and reach out for others and, and reach out for building more um, yes bridges to other networks. I guess. Um, it's a thing, no, no agency can do it for you. No 
with uh, other departments that can do it for you. You have to do it on your own. And this is uh, why companies in general don't understand because they said, okay, something out there, they should do social selling right now and we will be successful, but that this doesn't work. Thank you very much. This is very interesting. What I'm thinking, I make also a link. First, it's this journey and that we, it's not so easy to implement and to transform and they need guidance. But what I learned also, out, I would say, if I'm a consumer and I get in the interaction to you, I have to trust in the end also your products because otherwise you will have a bad image and you, I would not come back. It's something like a security because you have an interest to sell good products and to give the right information, not to make a good business for several months and then you are, have this image of, yeah, don't trust her in, in, in fact. I think this is, a, 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 I think less, a more, much more personal than only to spy on e-commerce platforms without communication, classical. And they, I want to come then to Camille Casalite. I have to say, uh, very interesting. You were nominated as one of the leading media outlets, uh, um, um, entrepreneurs on Belgium uh, at 1819 Brussels for entrepreneurs. Um, you are consulting SMEs and tech uh, companies. Um, you're doing both social uh, marketing and also social selling. There's a difference between, and I think this is also makes a difference how you will interact with consumers and clients. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Horst. Thank you to all of you. We have um, a very interesting discussion, and I think I will probably start off uh, with um, talking a little bit about social selling, but just in the view that social selling can be viewed as much more than just basically posting on social media platforms, but rather basically defining a, an omni-channel strategy where you can reach out to customers or anybody who is related to your product. So that, that doesn't mean that you are directly going and looking for people to directly sell, but rather you're engaging yourself um, in conversations that are tailored to your products. So let me just start off with basically saying that it's not uh, something that you would just like, you know, go on LinkedIn, connect with people and uh, send them invitations, basically saying, you know, hi, would you be interested in me selling you this or that? And what we generally do with such invitations, right? When we see it's not something that we need, we don't even accept people to our network. And this is a great example, basically showcasing that when you do those steps, but when you do them too early or too um, aggressively, they don't really work. Uh, so social selling is indeed about um, a combination of tools. And what is really interesting that now we see a lot of even startups and companies developing tools to help entrepreneurs um, find ways to, uh, to sell socially online. So it means that we have a lot of startup uh, SaaS software companies, which basically are saying, hey, this is my tool that will help you to pick best influencers. Hey, this is another tool that will help you to um, uh, reach out people on LinkedIn. We basically categorize people, uh, uh, relevant people for you with the relevant ages, income levels, etc., or people who have bought from your competitors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, this shift is really interesting for me personally about social selling in pandemic times because people are now only online. So this is your only chance. So you don't have physical. And it's really uh, difficult at the same time because maybe pre-COVID pre times you didn't have a strong online business. And now you have to be double strong. I mean, you, you not only have to have business online, but you have to also be really good there because you have to uh, express the same physical uh, experience online. So it's equally compelling because if you had a store, it was easy. Maybe people came in, you smiled, you showed them your beautiful products and yes, they were sold. Um, but it's not necessarily about only very sophisticated tools or you know, investing in, a, in, in, in expensive software com um, uh, companies or I mean in, in subscription plans. 
uh, that's one way. But another way is to simply use uh, commonly used tools such as, you know, WhatsApp. And if, for example, you have customers, then you can basically, you know, enter your shop, uh, um, hop on them with a video call through WhatsApp and show your products, which is something that a lot of even really, really big companies do when they have, for example, their um, fashion, big, big fashion brands, uh, they are now also selling through WhatsApp. So you can message uh, the, the sales associates and for example, say, you know, I'm interested in this and this, and you would arrange a certain visit, um, certain online call, and they would, you know, enter the shop and they will show you the products and then you choose the products and then they mail the products to you directly. So it's basically merging a lot of different channels and finding ways how to approach relevant people um, um, at the relevant times. But what's, what's really difficult also for small entrepreneurs is the, the fact that their competitors uh, also are, you know, everyone is now uh, on social selling. So you have to really find your unique approaches. Uh, what's, what's your value proposition and which conversations you're engaging? Because for small brands, it may be really, really hard to be everywhere. So you have to prioritize where I'm going next, uh, to which people I'm speaking, etc. Uh, so for me, I see that um, it's 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 a really interesting time, and it also sheds a new light on entrepreneurs. For example, in pre-COVID times, they were you know viewed as oh you know their lifestyle was something really. Um, difficult to understand for, for a lot of people. So, you know, how, how can you work from home all the time? How can you do, you know, um, be fully there, here and everywhere, you know, but now it's something that all people have, uh, have felt, had a grasp of it. And I'm really appreciating this time in that sense that uh, we now see that entrepreneurship is something that, you know, um, a lot of people can, um, can really uh, delve into, can really try it. Uh, it's not to say that it's for everyone, but I think now we need to really focus on, um, on um, finding the ways to present information on entrepreneurship, on, on funding guideline, uh, guidelines per se, because what is really difficult now, not only to get the funding, but also to, um, to find some commonly accepted uh, ways on how the, the funding is, uh, is um, is uh, how the companies are funded within the EU because there's no one uh, approach on which companies at which stages are getting which uh, which amounts of uh, funding injections and I think that's really difficult because now we're focusing on certain areas that are really um, that attract investors but this is also a burden for entrepreneurs that are working on other fields that are not so let's say marketed not so appealing for investors and it sort of creates a certain areas which are good to be in and the other areas are not so good so it's also difficult um, because for say uh, let's say a lot of funding um, companies or uh, venture capital is interested only in these areas of course it's good that they specialize in certain you know expertise but now what i see within uh, within eu uh, and many member states there are certain areas that people are investing only in and then there are other areas where basically uh, it's really difficult to get funding. So I think it's also an interesting topic that we can touch upon. And of course, I can talk for ages, but let's let's move forward and maybe engage into some uh, Q&A, etc. Thanks. Thank you very much, Camille. I think you mentioned good points also because uh, did you say to enter, it must be not always high tech and uh, then it's so, uh, um, SME last time in a webinar told us, yes, we're using WhatsApp, Facebook, Google. They are our competition, but our, also our tools. Uh, I, I think this is, this is this relation we have to understand. Um, and um, what you say also with these investments, and perhaps that we can also go back to uh, Alex, because I think there is the government needed to, to bring all the sectors digital and not left somebody behind. But we had also a question by Antea McIntyre, our president of SME Connect United Kingdom. Yeah, we have also this problem with the rural areas. The majority of SMEs are in the countryside and then have often, like we hear, not such a good access to, to the broadband. Uh, broad Alex, how 
how the strategy can be of the European Union to support the member states that we don't left people behind from certain regions, not to le let some sectors behind because they are not so fancy like others. Is there, can be the European Union do something to bring them on board? Yes, of course. I think this is a very good and relevant question in, in, in the discussion that we are having today. So, first of all, this, as you rightly pointed out, this should not be a fight of, of, of big tech giants against the, the small fry in the industry or vice versa. So, uh, entrepreneurs um, have to use also the ecosystem which is also provided by these big tech companies. So it's really important to have a system which is more inclusive, conductive, um, and, and basically gives a level playing field also to smaller ent entrepreneurs, startups, to be able to compete and also to be successful by using the ecosystem that is moved forward by um, by these big big tech companies and that's why we need to have rules and that's why it's so important the legislation the dma and dsa uh, regulations that we are discussing at this point because ultimately these will um, put forward the situation where rules are not dictated alone by these big tech giants but ultimately there will be european values which will be core at the core of the legislation that we are moving forward to deal with um, these, these, these companies so that we would have a more contestable market, a more contestable environment, which will ultimately be, I think it is one of the most important points for, for our SMEs and for our entrepreneurs uh, to have this, this contestable environment to be able to compete fairly there. But yes, I think that another point that we have to work and I think that as a European Union, we have a very important role to play there uh, when it comes also to giving a fair opportunity to also those entrepreneurs who basically are lacking the technology. As I said in my initial remarks, we ended up in this situation uh, where digitalization has also digitalization has also been prominent and important in our lives pre-COVID pandemic, but Today, our businesses, our entrepreneurs are more reliant on it. And the shift and the transition, uh, basically for a number of entrepreneurs to be so dependent on this digital infrastructure came from day to day. So unfortunately, although a lot of investment, a lot of discussion has uh, been held uh, on, on, on this transition that we were also going to during the past years and months, still the pandemic came from day to day upon us and a lot of, and a big number, a big chunk of enterprises had to basically, um, basically alter their working methods and be more reliant on this infrastructure, even, and especially in these circumstances that you are mentioning, that infrastructure is also lacking and basically more difficult. Uh, to, 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 to achieve, especially when you're speaking about rural communities, etc. There, the problems are more prominent, the difficulties are more prominent. So yes, apart from legislation, I think that as an EU, we have to work more when it comes to funding opportunities, when it comes also to giving the tools also to, to these startups, to these entrepreneurs to be basically more able to compete because ultimately that is the most important thing um, that we have to achieve, be more competitive, be more competitive by um, embracing as much as possible this, this digital uh, transition uh, and basically be competitive on the online ecosystem. If you're not competitive there today, I think that you will not uh, be able to fairly compete. Uh, in today's day and age. So it's really important to give, to, to give the right uh, regulatory environment, but at the same time, to give the right infrastructure uh, to each uh, and, and, and every entrepreneur to be able to compete in this heavily uh, digitalized system that we are living in today.
Thank you very much. I think it's very important only then we have the exception of the majority of the society to embrace digitalization. Anna, after you heard this, this, this feedback of, of our speakers, I, I see that, that you, you spoke also, or we, we heard, or we could see in your report also these obstacles, how you are not to be afraid or why, how not to open an e-commerce business, not to social selling. Um, if, you, if you hear this, can it be also, we talk, talked also about digital tax to find partners uh, like consultants like Peterson or Castellit, uh, Michael, Camille, or is this also because you made this report for Amway, franchises, companies who are helping you to enter? Is this, is this a way where you see, especially women are doing needs, would easier go to, to, to this way if they would have a first help for the first step? Please. Um, yeah, there, there are uh, regarding what, there are two different questions regarding the obstacles. Uh, yeah, one of the main uh, is still one of the main obstacles that uh, men and men and women uh, find is uh, fundraising. Yeah, the, the money always is the problem. So always the problem to become an entrepreneur is in the environment. It's not the they they have the passion. Uh, most of them have the, the education, uh, but but they don't have the money. So uh, and sometimes women um, have at the beginning more uh, difficult to uh, start their business. So yeah, in this uh, Angway report, they include other mm, different uh, business models that can be considered a kind of entrepreneurship. It's not a, a pure. Enter, enter, it's not a startup as, as, as we, we, when we think in a new entrepreneur who is taking the risk, the, the, the complete risk. So it's, it's a kind of entrepreneurship, but it's considered as well. And, and yeah, sometimes in this other uh, uh, business opportunity, uh, uh, women uh, uh, find easier to start uh, their business. So yeah, yeah, there are some of them that, that are uh, easier for women. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Michael, um, what you would say is, is, is the main um, obstacles for, for female entrepreneurs, but in general, that we can handle this to make the first step. Uh, you say how, what we can do or better. Are the, are the, the established companies uh, easier enter the, the digital marketing, social selling or, but if you went to go, want to go as a single person to use this opportunity, are the obstacles too high or what, how you can find partnership, how you can find guidance? Please, Michael. Okay, I, I try to um, answer the question or lots of the questions I tried. So. Um, one thing I have in my mind is, um, is what obstacles are there for women and how can we reach out hands? So I guess men mentorship or, or mentors is very important for this to um, lower the obstacles. Uh, maybe there are just obstacles in mind, but not, not really obstacles. Really obstacles are uh, fun, um, finding finance, definitely. But um, I guess it's uh, Miriam Wohlfahrt. Uh, she just uh, informed that she uh, is uh, interested or she, she opened um, or supported a founding company just for women, for founders, for, for entrepreneurs. So there is a change in, inside the market. Um, and it will be necessary um, to have an eye on it and to speak about it, I guess, talking about to embrace other female Swiss entrepreneurs' ideas, to embrace them and to um, give them the trust that is, is possible. And outside, looking outside at the market and um, um, just viewing what some really small business made last year inside the Corona pandemic, um, there are, for example, in at TikTok, lots of examples 
for really small business, for example, sticker business, just um, they started with um, here, my passion is I do sell, collect different stickers and let me know inside the comments if you're interested. So they started with on this space, just going out and uh, it was not really a business from the first moment. It was not really a, a social selling idea from the beginning, but um, uh, inside the last year, 2020, then they grow up to millions. I don't know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I didn't remember the name of the companies, but there were, were really lots of proof that it is possible. And the point is, um, we have to go outside and tell people, young people, old people, entrepreneurs, um, with the willingness to, to found something, it is possible, here's the best case, and you can, you can repeat it. So um, it's maybe not stickers, your, your businesses will not be stickers, but it will be something different. And there are, for example, small companies, um, let me say Snox as an example, it's a German company, and they started by having an idea. And now, and they have an e-commerce business, and but they, 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 a really um, huge part is being active uh, on social and why this doing social selling. So uh, in the uh, presentation, Anna, I saw always um, e-commerce or social selling, but for me, in my understanding, it's not an or; it's a combining. <laughs> combine these things together; they are really powerful. So um, my, my message is, let's talk about these best chance, uh, best best cases, and let's talk about positive stories. So other person, or an especially female person, can lower their obstacles in their mind and grab the chance to, to do it. And we have to support them on the finance way, definitely. Thank you very much, Maike. Now we're coming to Camille. We have a question from the audience, Imelda Vital. Digitalization social selling has helped many small entrepreneurs, including direct sellers, to survive through the crisis and even grow their business. How can we support this response to the pandemic to become a long-term shift? Can this be really a chance, Camille, that how about we need now uh, directly to, to speed it up, to, to, uh, to encourage this, this people who went now with the direct selling to, to the digital channels, please? Indeed, I agree. It's it's a great chance. It's a great opportunity. And of course, as pandemic shows us all, uh, for business uh, in pre-pandemic times, if you grow, there was one rate of, of acceleration, but now it's even faster. So if the time is now, if you're about to grow, you will grow three times faster than you was able to do it before the pandemic. So indeed, it's an opportunity. And I think big marketplaces, be it Facebook, be it Instagram, Google, they have given us the tools and most of the tools are totally free and they're there for our utilization. But I think what's also maybe stopping entrepreneurs and what's, what's really a burden is probably the fact that they're afraid to invest and start businesses right now because they have seen so many cases where you know businesses fail uh, during the, the 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 COVID times, so they're also uncertain about how governments are supporting these businesses. And if you have uh, maybe okay, maybe now you would do only digital, but what happens if your business? I mean, it still has to have some physical points. Maybe it's uh, uh, some storage space or or some pickup points, whatever that is. Uh, I think one of the important aspects is the. Um, uh, is the different uh, support in different member sta states for uh, business uh, business owners during the COVID-19 crisis. I think that's something uh, maybe we haven't mentioned already in the discussion, but I think it's also one of these points where uh, entrepreneurs now really need to rethink whether they want to start because in some member states, for example, where I'm originally from, Lithuania, for example, uh, now the support is, I think, 250 euros per person. And, and that's just, you know, not the type of money you can survive at all. So I think, um, indeed, those tools are there for us and we need to utilize. And I think it's, um, I can encourage everyone that all the information is online so you don't in the beginning you don't really need to 
Um, you just need to read the information. You need to go to the channels. You need to try out yourself what works for your business and what, what not. And it's all there. It's all free. It's all there for you. And in the beginning, you don't need a lot of investment to start off something to see if it works. And lastly, in the topic of women empowerment, I think it's great that there's so many women out there talking about their experience and social media amplifies that that woman woman empowerment topic and i think there were even cases where it was um maybe even more easy for women to uh, get funded because there were so many venture capitals aimed at women or there were so many um uh, companies who, who were working with increasing women women founders in their in their shareholders etc so it's also so many initiatives that in some cases, if, if you're a man, that it's even um, more difficult for you. So just on a positive note, I wanted to say that it's not always the case that, you know, women are, 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 are the ones that are, you know, uh, facing challenges. But on the other hand, I think that the, the most commonly uh, faced challenges by women is the fact that the, the way they are raised, if they're raised uh, to do things, if they're encouraged by the community, if they receive the support from their very close surroundings, they will grow and they will be entrepreneurs. Um, but if they, for example, start family, get children really early, then it's really difficult for them to see um, to get that inspiration to get out, find a job or found a company. So I think it's also not only the problem of, of per se uh, legislation, but it's also a problem of, uh, you know, education, perhaps. Thank you. I think this links to the next uh, question and I go to Benedict. It's from Amelie Parakat Emperor. Um, it's about... Um, Data definitely shows that the willingness from Europeans to start their own business despite the existence of challenges and barriers. How can you explain the difference between United States and the EU figures with regards to business interest? Um, if I have this feeling, if he's speaking in Europe of, about startups, you're sp speaking only about tech startups. Is this also one problem? Benedict, please. I think Emily is, is on the money with the question. I think um, the mentality or the change differences in culture are for sure um, a key a key difference. And, you know, this is probably subject for several webinars again. Um, I want to, I mean, I think the other one that was mentioned was access to finance. And um, obviously Europe still has a way to go here, but it's also interesting. I've recently seen a report from Deal Room, which kind of put the, the, the amount of uh, VCs and, and money invested in startups uh, on a time scale and compared it to Europe. And it showed that we are basically, we have the same growth trajectory um, as, as the US has for, for VC invested in startups, which is eight to 10 years behind. Um, so th there's a point to be made about, you know, making sure that we continue a lot of the good work uh, and a lot of the uh, um, um, digitization uh, uh, that we have seen. And uh, to answer a question that from before as well, I think, you know, if what we can do, um, if we think of, you know, startups like the one for Camille and, and Mike and other businesses we've seen represented here, um, how can we complete the digital single market? Um, and, you know, I, I, Horst, I don't need to tell you about the kind of the stories about folks selling and dealing with different VAT regimes uh, across Europe. If we are saying now that more and more are going online and, and selling across borders in Europe, are we really uh, there yet with the digital single market? I think there's still room to go here. And I think it would probably also, you know, make it a lot easier for startups in Europe, uh, back to Amelie, to actually uh, challenge if they have a bigger market to compete in. Thank you very much. And I think we're coming now to the end of, of our very interesting uh, webinar. Um, in fact, uh, Alex, I would end with a question that perhaps this is the beginning or the, the start for our next webinar. We have a question from Udo Books. He is the chair of the CSU Brussels. Uh, what will be the impact of DSA and DMA on the landscape for social platform selling? Do you want to say something shortly or we should really yes. plan a next mm. webinar about this? And he's also asking, when will be, will be the impact in three, four years, when we can really feel the, the, the changes? So I think this is a very good question, which again, as, as you said, host, we need, we need another webinar or more than one to answer. Yes. But, but 
So, first of all, I think that we are already very late. We are already very late in the day when we have basically a system, the e-commerce directive, a 20-year-old directive, which is basically um, setting out the rules and the parameters for these platforms um, for, the, for our ecosystem as a whole, digital ecosystem as a whole to function and work. So we have a legislation which was created before, uh, yes, before the realities that we are facing today with these big platforms dominating our lives, basically. So, 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 so I think that there we are already a bit too late and it is of utmost importance that the process uh, is, is concluded in the nearest uh, nearest time possible so first of all i think that 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 point of having to act fast to update our legislation uh, is 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 should be our priority but definitely when it comes to um, online marketplaces when it comes to online selling um, social selling i think that definitely these will be heavily uh, affected by both pieces of, of, of legislation that we are moving forward. And I think that they will be affected if uh, the commission and the council will basically maintain the same level of ambition uh, that is found also in our proposals will, will definitely be affected in a positive way. Because basically what we are moving forward, what we are proposing is to have more transparency, to have a higher level of consumer protection, to have a more contestable market by moving forward a number of key principles, key points, which will definitely be uh, of utmost help to startups, to SMEs, to entrepreneurs who are trying to be competitive and are struggling as we speak. So uh, we don't want to paint a dull picture of, 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 of our ecosystem, but the challenges are there. And a lot of these challenges are there and have been there for a number of years now, but are more prevalent today during the pandemic that we are living because of this behavioral shift that we have seen both from the consumers and also from the entrepreneurs themselves going more digitally. But these loopholes, these gap holes that we have, we have to fill them in. And we have to fill them in by a legislation which will balance all the different interests that we have, but Ultimately, I think that the most important thing is to bolster and increase consumer confidence in the system, because ultimately, if we don't have consumer confidence, which is high, which trust the digital environment and there, I think that we have to work more. Ultimately, it would be it would not make sense to continue to invest uh, further in this sector. So I think that the balance, a balanced legislation that will definitely not stifle innovation that will be giving a helping hand to our innovators, startups, entrepreneurs, SMEs, but at the same time, based on European values, core European values, which are so important for us, I think that is the right way forward. There are a number, I'm, I'm not going into the details, the nitty gritty of the proposals that will basically take center stage during the discussions that we will be having during the next months and years ahead when it comes to both the SA and the MA, but ultimately the packages as a whole would definitely, I believe, work in favor of a more contestable environment, higher consumer protection, and a fairer chance to entrepreneurs, startups, and SMEs to be able to compete more fairly and have a better chance to be successful. Thank you very much, Alex. I think this was a great closing. Uh, I think uh, it's an outlook also for our next webinars. I say thank you to our speakers. I always have to say it was very interesting, a lot of aspects. Uh, I would like to invite you all to our working group, Entrepreneurship and Self-Employment, where we have this entrepreneur spirits uh, to, to promote, and also to the working group Platform Economy, hosted by Mr. Saliba. And I think uh, we have to bring all this experience together, legislation, and also the practical side from the ground to make the best things for our future. Thank you very much and go selling in the internet. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>